All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, my name is Lindsay. I'm the education coordinator for the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society. And tonight we're gonna be diving into the world of sharks. So I always like to take a moment uh, before I start any of our programs to thank our partners and sponsors because without their help and support, we truly would not be able to fulfill our mission of promoting marine conservation through action. I do have some learning objectives for us this evening. First, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to our organization. You'll often hear me refer to it as AMCs, just because that's a long name to say over and over again. We're going to go over the species of sharks, specifically ones that we can find in New York waters. We're gonna highlight shark research programs within the New England area. We're going to go over some of the threats that sharks are facing on a global scale. And then finally, and in my opinion, most importantly, how you can help and contribute to shark conservation. So first, what is AMCs? AMCs is an organization that was essentially founded by a group of volunteers in 2016 who were looking to make a difference in the marine environment. We began responding to stranded marine mammals and sea turtles in 2017, and since then have responded to over 1,000 animals. When these animals strand, it can be for a variety of reasons. They can be sick, injured, or already deceased. If they're already deceased, we're going to do a necropsy, which is an autopsy, but on an animal. And through that necropsy, we're ultimately trying to learn not only how the animal lived its life, but ultimately what caused their life to end. Um, outside of doing our stranding response in our necropsies, we do seal health assessments, where in the wintertime, we actually go out, capture wild seals, and do a full checkup on them, like the doctor does for us when we go visit them. We look at their eyes, their nose, their mouth, their ears, we'll look at their overall body condition. We'll take a blood sample to screen them for any diseases that they might have. We'll attach a flipper tag, and we'll also attach a satellite tag. And from that satellite tag, we can learn how these seals are navigating through our marine environment. Do they stay around Long Island? Do they go down to New Jersey? Do they go north towards Maine? And that's really what we're looking at. And then we share this information with local stakeholders so that we all have a better understanding of how our marine environment is being utilized by the animals that call it home. We also do education outreach events like the one we are doing this evening. And really this is the most exciting part of my job is being able to connect with members of the community and hopefully inspire them to become positive stewards of the environment. So there's a lot of different aspects to our organization um, and we have a lot of ways that people can be involved. So we do have a volunteer program and here in this photo, top left corner, our volunteers are helping us with the exam of a deceased loggerhead sea turtle. So our uh, volunteers can be trained to help us respond to these strandings, help us with necropsies and really kind of jump, jump all in. We also have an internship program, which Carrie Ann is a part of, and our interns can help us in a variety of ways. Um, they can help us with our field work. So helping with strandings and necropsies. Um, they can help us with our sea turtle critical care facility. So we currently have eight sea turtles in rehab that were cold stunned up in Cape Cod and uh, transported to us last December. I'm very excited to say that they are actually going to be released in the coming weeks um, right off the shore of Long Island. It's very exciting. We work very closely with the towns, municipalities, um, as not many people realize, when these animals strand on the shoreline, whoever owns that property is actually responsible for that animal. So we get to know um, mayors, uh, the Coast Guard quite well through our work. Um, and our relationships with them are very important to us um, as sometimes these animals can strand in places that aren't super easy for us to access by foot or by vehicle. Um, so we really enjoy our partnerships with them. And last but certainly not least, members of the public. So you guys play a very important role in conservation efforts across the state of New York. We're going to highlight Long Island this evening. 
Um, and ultimately, you guys really can have a huge impact um, on what our environment looks like for generations to come. So now getting into the sharks of the world. So does anybody wanna take a guess as to what might be the biggest shark in the world? And I'll give you a hint, it is not listed on here. You guys can unmute yourself and shout it out or you can put it in the chat. Any guesses? We did get someone in the chat. Carolina said whale shark. Ah, you would be correct, Carolina. The whale shark is the largest uh, shark that we can find in the world. Does anyone want to take a guess at the smallest shark? And it is also not listed on here. <laughs> So Carolina guess nurse shark. Good guess, but not quite. Maybe one more guess. No guesses? Well, the smallest shark is going to be the dwarf lantern shark. Um, and we will get into that in just a few minutes. But fossil records dating back to 400 million years ago, sharks have outlived the dinosaurs and many other forms of life, which are still on earth, including our horseshoe crabs. There's more than 1000 species of sharks and rays and new species are constantly being discovered. So the largest shark being the whale shark can be kind of confusing since whale is in the name. Some people confuse it with being a marine mammal, but it is in fact a shark. And the largest confirmed whale shark individual was 18.8 meters long, quite large, but they're very slow moving and they travel long distances just to find enough food to sustain their large size. They are filter feeders, so they're going to be feeding on plankton. So we have nothing to worry about with these guys. Um, they're big and they're beautiful. And if you ever get the chance to snorkel or scuba dive um, within the area of these animals, I highly recommend it. They can be found in all tropical oceans around the world. Um, and females give birth to live pups. So they give birth to these live fish, uh, but we actually don't know where in the world this happens or where the pups go after they're born. Something scientists haven't been able to quite figure out yet. Now our smallest shark being the dwarf lantern shark, quite small compared to the whale shark. They're smaller than a human hand and they've really only been observed a few times off the northern tip of South America at depths between about 900 to 1500 feet deep. So they're quite um, deep in the water. And they actually have light emitting organs called photophores along their belly and along their fins. And these help them camouflage when they're feeding in shallower water. So their belly that lights up blends in with the sunlight streaming down through the surface. And in darker water, the light actually attracts smaller animals, which then the shark will feed on. So that's a cool adaptation that they have. And they've got pretty big eyes for a shark and for their size. And it's to help them see in those mostly dark waters um, when they're living within the twilight zone of the ocean. So now we're going to get into our New York shark species. Before I go any further, do we have any questions in the chat, Carrie Ann, or am I good to move on? You're good. Awesome. So first we are going to talk about the basking shark. So they can grow to be about 40 feet long. Their habitat is mostly offshore 
um, and they can be found at the surface within those deeper waters. They're also a filter feeder. So again, nothing for us to worry about because they're gonna be consuming zooplankton, teeny tiny little organisms. They're also very so slow swimmers. They kind of just cruise along through the water. They only reach maturity at about 12 to 16 years old. And at that point, they're about 16 to 20 feet long, but they can live 50 or more years they also give birth to live pups and the female's gestational period is about three years. So they're really not reproducing that quickly. Next, we have our blue shark. So they grow to be about 12 and a half feet long um, and their habitat is also mostly offshore. So we won't really be seeing them um, in our coastal waters. They're also slow swimmers, but if you look at their tail, you can see that they can actually move quite quickly through the water when they want to, uh, but they're gonna be feeding primarily on squid and mostly smaller fish items. Uh, they grow to be um, by maturity about six to seven feet long, so about half their size, and they reach maturity between four to seven years old, so much faster than the basking shark. And they only live to about 20 years or so. So you'll find a lot of our shark species don't necessarily live um, a long, <coughs> excuse me, a long lifetime. Um, but something that you will continuously hear me say over and over again is that these fish basically are giving birth to live pups. So something different from some of our fish species, as sharks are fish, some fish will lay eggs and let their um, little fishies hatch from those. Most of our sharks are going to give birth to live pups, which kind of, that's going to separate our sharks from the other fish species. Then we get into our common thresher shark. So I don't know about y'all, but I think this shark looks super cool. They can grow to be about 25 feet long. That is including their long uh, caudal fin or rear fin. And their habitat is coastal and offshore waters. So they can be found closer to that shoreline. And they're gonna kind of herd in schools of fish. Um, and then they use their large caudal or their tail fin to basically stun their prey. So as they herd them in, they then use their rear fin to kind of smack the fish uh, and stun them a little bit. And then they're able to easily feed on um, the school of fish. They're very strong swimmers and they sometimes can be found like leaping out of the water, kind of like a whale or a dolphin breaching. Uh, and the fish that they're gonna be feeding on, usually butterfly fish or blue fish, uh, menhaden, also called bunker, um, and even some mackerel. So just some of those average fish sizes. They normally reach maturity between eight to 12 years old when they reach about 10 to 15 feet long and they can live 45 to 50 years. So they can actually live quite a long time as well. The dusky shark um, looks like a pretty standard shark in my opinion, nothing super interesting about how they physically look. They can grow to be about 14 feet long. They are found in coastal and offshore habitats. They're gonna be eating mostly of those bony fish um, cephalopods, and even crustaceans. So think like hard shelled organisms. They're very slow growing and late maturing. So they don't reach maturity till like 16 to 23 years old. So that's actually quite a long time to wait to reach maturity. And they live to about 45 years. Um, and they can, uh, they also give birth to live pups, but they have about 14 pups within their average litter. So they're giving birth to a lot of small little dusky sharks, essentially in the hoping that they survive to adulthood. The sand tiger shark. So this one is pretty interesting. I know we've heard a little bit about it lately um, within the news. So their size can be to about 10 and a half feet uh, and they can be found in coastal and offshore habitats. And they actually use the Long Island Sound estuaries, or excuse me, Long Island estuaries, such as the Great South Bay, and the Long Island Sound because they provide nurseries for these juvenile sand tiger sharks. 
during the summer months. So the sharks can pretty much go within these estuaries, cruise around, feed on multiple different prey items, and they don't have to worry about other predators coming for them. Um, their prey that they're going to be feeding on, though, mostly those bony fish that I mentioned earlier, cephalopods and crustaceans, again, which are abundant within our estuaries. They reach maturity about 10, uh, six to 10 years old, but they only live for 15 years, maybe longer if they're lucky. Um, and something uh, interesting about them is they're, that they're actually a relatively docile species of shark, uh, but their interactions are more likely to occur just because they can be found within that coastal environment. So the more of them that are there, the higher chance that they have of interacting with the human. So actually in 2018, so I know there have been recent reports as well, but about four years ago, there were two um, non-fatal, unprovoked um, shark bites in the surf off of Fire Island. And officials believe that it was two different sharks that were involved. It was not the same shark. Um, and biologists were actually able to use the DNA from a tooth fragment that was removed from one of the people who got bit to determine that at least one of the sharks was a sand tiger shark. And at the time there was a large abundance of prey, specifically menhaden, and there was kind of poor water clarity in the surf. So it was a little turbid kind of stirred up. So it was really believed that the presence of the prey and the poor um, water clarity is really what caused these bites to occur. And they were not intentional by any means um, of the sharks. Then we have our, um, and this is what the sand tiger shark looks like. So seeing those teeth, that's what the biologists were able to use to DNA the animal. Now getting into our sandbar shark, um, also called the brown shark. Uh, they can grow to be about eight feet long also in coastal and offshore waters, they're actually gonna feed on kind of bottom dwellers. Um, so they're gonna feed mainly on flounders, uh, skates and rays, blue crabs. So animals that are really sticking to that benthic or bottom environment. They reach maturity at about only five feet long um, and 15 to 18 years old, but they only live to be about 20 to 30 years old. Um, and again, they're one of those species giving birth to those live pups. Then we have our short fin mako shark. They grow to about 13 feet. They are an offshore species. So we won't necessarily see these guys near our coastline, but they are the fastest shark in the world. And we can kind of tell that just based on how their body is so streamlined. And if you look at their caudal or their rear fin, that shape is what helps them to swim so quickly. Uh, they have burst speeds of up to about 45 miles per hour. So as fast as we might drive on some back roads, uh, but their fit, their prey that they're going to feed on kind of matches their speed. So they're going to be feeding on those really fast moving, um, what we would call pelagic fish, like tuna, swordfish, um, billfish, sometimes even other sharks, uh, and squid as well. So they're going to reach maturity at around six to nine feet long, eight to 18 years old, but they only live to be about 20 years old. So they reach maturity pretty late in their life. Then moving into our smooth hammerhead shark. So one of my favorite shark species, they grow to be about 16 feet long. They can be found in coastal and offshore waters. They're one of four hammerhead species. So although all of our hammerheads look pretty similar, there are some genetic differences that make them different species. They're gonna feed mostly on bony fish, those cephalopods and crustaceans, again, similar to some of our other species. They're gonna reach maturity at about seven to nine feet long. And at least 20 years old or older is when they'll reach uh, maturity. And they give birth to a lot of pups. Typically their litter is about 20 to 40 pups. Um, so it is a lot of um, reproducing that they're doing. And their gestational period is actually only 10 to 11 months, one of the shorter uh, periods for sharks. 
Then getting into our white shark, commonly referred to as a great white, but greats are actually not really a part of their name. As you could probably guess, they grow to be 18 feet long or longer, and their habitat is coastal and offshore waters. Uh, juvenile white sharks do use the Long Island's coastal ocean for that nursery habitat throughout the warm season, so our summer months. They are strong swimmers, and they're considered ambush predators, so they're pretty quiet. They're just going to kind of sneak up on their prey and ambush them. They're going to be eating, um, for juveniles, they're going to be eating bony fish, but our predators are going to feed on larger prey items such as seals, other sharks, rays, and they've also been known to um, feed on deceased whales, uh, which is something that we have encountered in our line of work. They reach maturity at about 10 to 16 feet long, but they are at least 26 years old when they reach maturity. Sometimes they get into their 30s before they reach maturity. And that's because they should be living up to about 70 years old. So they have a very long lifespan. Um, and their pups, they give birth to pups in small numbers and their gestational period is at least a year to a year and a half. Um, so they're really not reproducing um, a large amount of offspring um, each with each pregnancy. So with that, does anybody have any questions about the species of sharks that we could see in our waters? You can put them in the chat, you can say them out loud. Yeah, hi, Lindsay, this is Patrick. Uh, what is the most common species of shark, I guess, that we find up here? That is a good question. So we can often find the sand tiger shark um, and that's just because they are gonna be a coastal species. So we might just have more sightings of them where similar to our marine mammals and sea turtles, sighting them out in deeper waters, it's very opportunistic. Mostly fishermen are gonna be seeing them if they're fishing for a similar species that the shark might be going for. Um, so I would say the sand tiger shark, uh, sandbar sharks also might be one that we could see uh, commonly as well. Good question. Anybody else? And we can move on. So far, nothing in the chat. All right. Um, so moving on to some of our research programs. So New York and New England, obviously we have sharks present in our waters. Therefore, we're going to have researchers um, working with them. So the first one I wanna highlight is the SOFO Shark Research and Education Program. So their mission is to enhance stewardship of Long Island shark community through uh, scientific research, data sharing with marine resource managers, and educating the public about their important ecological roles. So their team, along with a number of collaborators, have satellite tagged and released over 30 juvenile white sharks since the program began in 2015. So they're really receiving what we would call groundbreaking data about the habits of these juvenile sharks from the research that they're doing. And really this data is then provided to marine resource managers to establish better management plans for the health of the marine ecosystem. All sharks that they catch, as you can see in this photo, are caught, tagged and released in a very timely manner to minimize the stress on these animals. And anytime they're working with these animals, as you see, they're kind of working um, over the edge of the boat. Um, so this is because sharks are fish. So they need water passing over their gills to breathe. So they're not like our marine mammals or sea turtles, which can be removed from the water. So those sharks are gonna be staying within the water while they're working them up. Um, and the satellite tags that they attach will release from the sharks after a program number of days, float to the surface and transmit the collected data via satellite tag or satellite to their computers. And the tags are able to share data that goes along with the depth and the temperature from the sharks movements um, through our New York waters and really provide scientists um, insight into the habitat use of the sharks within our region. 
So if you guys are not familiar with this organization, I highly recommend that you do a little Google search, check them out and um, support them if possible. And this gives you a look at the tag that they would put on their dorsal or their top fin um, that would release after um, a certain number of days, whatever they've programmed into the tag. So getting into our Massachusetts Shark Research Program. So this is run by the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. And sharks travel to Massachusetts waters each spring, summer, and fall, um, kind of, you know, like on a clock, uh, in search of food and mating opportunities. Those, so those, those are the two main reasons that they're there. Uh, and at least a dozen shark species visit the Massachusetts coastline from May to November. And they migrate from their wintering areas, which is off of the southeastern United States and within the Gulf of Mexico, and even the mid-Atlantic and deeper ocean waters. Um, and they really come to Massachusetts because they have nutrient-rich waters and, again, those mating opportunities. So sharks in general are highly migratory fish. They like to keep it moving, um, but they can really differ dramatically in their shape, their size, and even their natural history. So our oceanic sharks, like our blue and our mako, um, largely remain miles offshore, while coastal sharks, like the sand tiger and the smooth dogfish, uh, swim closer to shore and even enter bays and estuaries. And some species, like the basking shark, can be found inshore and offshore. But regardless, all of these species are going to be um, here seasonally, but their most well-known visitor, as we've heard time and time again in Massachusetts, is going to be um, the white shark. So with um, their research, their program is mainly studying the biology of sharks, highlighting the white shark um, within those Massachusetts waters because they're really trying to understand the ecology, the distribution of these sharks, um, you know, how many are here, when are they here, where are they going, um, and ultimately, what habitat are they using? So one of their lead scientists, Greg Skomal, is actually working on a project to estimate the seasonal, seasonal predation rates of white sharks on seals, specifically gray seals, along the coast of Cape Cod, and really trying to identify what environmental conditions are associated with their predatory behavior. And this is ultimately going to be used to help improve public safety practices within the region. So some one reason that we aren't necessarily finding those white sharks down here closer to shore, they can be seen offshore, but closer to shore um, in more abundant numbers is because our seal species aren't really hanging out around here year round they are heading north in the summertime. So the white sharks, which remember one of our larger species, they're going after those large prey items like seals. So they're gonna go up there um, to hunt for them where we don't necessarily have that food source here for them. Um, and hopefully we can keep it that way. But this research is super important because over the last decade or so, Cape Cod has really become known for <sighs> having this aggregation of the white sharks right off of their shoreline, having numerous uh, human interactions due to the sharks hunting near the shore for the seals. So ultimately really trying to have a better understanding of their hunting um, process and patterns um, and really trying to overlap it with uh, the use of recreational water activity and hoping to mitigate the conflict between sharks and humans. So now getting into the White Atlantic Shark Conservancy. So their mission is to support um, scientific research, improve public safety, and educate the community to inspire white shark conservation. Uh, white, sharks were, white sharks were designated as a protected species in most federal waters in uh, the late 1990s and in Massachusetts state waters in 2005. Um, so beforehand, white sharks could be hunted. They were actually considered more of like a trophy fish 
um, for recreational fishers. And in the past decade, these shark sightings and catch records in the broader Northwest Atlantic have increased, which suggests that the population has started to recover um, from those fishing habits. But their stock status, um, which is basically like their population numbers, we're still not totally sure where they're at, which is why they remain protected. Um, and the increased presence of white sharks closer to shore off of Cape Cod, as I mentioned, where this research is happening, also where the seals are. So kind of go hand in hand since they're that reliable food source for these sharks. Um, so while they are still trying to study the habitat use and their movements, um, the main objective of the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy's research is to document those fine scale movements of these sharks to better provide a more detailed picture of their predatory behavior, specifically off of Cape Cod. And the results from this are going to assist with management plans um, and really provide information to, again, mitigate that conflict. So we have a lot of different organizations working on similar research, sharing research back and forth, which is really what the science community is about, is collaboration. These animals, migratory species, they're not always going to be in your waters. They might be in someone else's waters. So sharing our data um, is ultimately what moves us towards um, better management practices. So we do have the NOAA Cooperative Shark Tagging Program. So the Northeast Fisheries Science Center Apex Predators Program studies the site history and ecology of sharks in uh, the coastal and marine environment, uh, specifically off of New England and the Mid-Atlantic. And in 1962, they began this cooperative shark tagging program with about 100 volunteer recreational and commercial fishermen, scientists, and fisheries observers. Today, they have more than 7,000 volunteers who contribute data to their tagging program. And more than 295,000 sharks with more than 50 species included in that have been tagged uh, to date. And the data from these tagging and recapture events is really critical to us understanding shark migration and their distribution patterns. Um, and it's really helped us to understand their habitat for 38 federally managed species of sharks. So ones that are being federally looked at um, by the United States government. And it really helps us kind of designate certain areas that are critical to shark survival. So us understanding what areas we really need to protect for these species to be able to flourish and keep their population numbers abundant. As we went through those shark species, they're not having a lot of pups and they're not having pups frequently. So them repopulating is a quite a slow process. So we want to keep these sharks alive and healthy and getting to those reproductive ages, those maturity ages, um, so that they can keep um, their population numbers elevated. Um, blue sharks are a common pelagic species that are found in the New England waters. And through this program, um, more than 100,000 of them have been tagged. They're one of the most tagged species through this particular program. Um, and in fact, they're actually about 42% of all the tagged sharks recorded in the database. And 7% have been recaptured at least once. So they're kind of, that's showing us that they're hanging out in the same areas and being captured um, more than one time. So does anybody have any questions about shark research before we get into some videos? No? Okay. Oh, we've got some amazing video to show you this morning. Thousands of black tip sharks hanging out right off the coast of Palm Beach County right now. <laughs> right. We just see one, but trust us, <laughs> oh, there's a bunch there of them. Are. WPTV News Channel 5's Alana Quillen is at Jupiter Beach with why they're here. 
Well, it's just that time of the year for shark migrations. I want to give you a little shot of the beach right now, the sun over the ocean. I know you can't see it from this perspective, but there are thousands of those black tip sharks being spotted within 100 to 200 yards off the beach. And here's the video from up high to give you that perspective. Scientists tell us the frigid waters up north are sending more sharks migrating down to our neck of the woods. And it's a welcome sight after a huge decrease in migration numbers last year. Now, a few great whites being tracked by researchers have also pinged off the Florida coast since November. Now, these black tip sharks normally appear in mid-January. They stay here for about two months, and they can grow to around six feet long. Scientists say they're really just following schools of fish to feed on. So don't worry if you plan on coming to the beach for a swim or just a nice beach day. Scientists say that attacks are not likely sharks. So that was obviously a video from Florida. We don't live in Florida, but that's showing you that these species highly migratory. Some of the species they have down here, we have up here as well. So this video, you guys might recognize, this is from last summer um, off of Fire Island. So I believe this is drone footage that was shot by the SOFO Shark Research Program. Um, and as you will see, well, we can see it right now, a huge school of bunker, um, a lot of fish gathered in one area. So naturally, this being a prey item for some of our shark species is going to attract our sharks, as that is a lot of food for them to consume right there. You can see the sharks moving through the school of fish. The fish are somewhat unbothered, it seems. Like they just kind of move out of the way, a part of the sea um, for these sharks to move through and as they're feeding. And this is what we see happening a lot of times when we hear instances of people being kind of nipped um, and slightly bit by different sharks um, within the coastal habitat. That's often because they're in what's called a feeding frenzy. They're going after their prey items and they're not necessarily even thinking about their surroundings. They're so hyper-focused on getting their next meal. And sometimes us humans enjoying the oceanic water are somewhat within their area um, of their, that they're hunting within. Oftentimes people just slightly get bit. Um, it does might require some stitches, but overall the human survives. So that's something to note. These sharks are not actively going for humans. Usually it's a wrong place, wrong time for the human. And the sharks sometimes mistake humans for other prey items, such as when humans are on surfboards. That to a shark looks very similar to a seal swimming along in the water. So that's why they might come up, get a little curious. They might bite at the board. They might bite at your hands if you're paddling. Um, but it's usually a case of mistaken identity. And that's why you don't hear necessarily these frequent stories about sharks, you know, causing a human to pass away because usually it's a small bite. They realize that human is not exactly what I was going for. You don't taste anything like a seal and they're going to move on. They're not going to waste their energy on hunting something that is not going to fulfill or kind of, you know, satiate their appetite. So Lindsay, we actually have a question in the chat. Okay. Um, Grayson asked if all the pumpkins 
hunger piling up like that, if that's normal for that to happen? It is normal. So our fish are typically found within schools. This is like a mega school of fish. That usually happens because of the way the water is moving with our currents. And so they all kind of gather up together. Um, also within these schools of fish, um, you know, we often heard the phrase stronger in numbers. That's how our fish move about as well. Great question. All right, so it's pretty much more of the same, um, but if you're interested, I believe you probably could find this on YouTube as well. So now we're gonna get into some of the threats that sharks are facing on a global scale. This isn't necessarily within New York waters, but the first one we're gonna talk about is longline fishing and bycatch. So longline fishing is a technique that is used to catch fish in open water, so deep sea waters. And it involves this main float line, which you can see here with the orange buoys on it. Oops. And uh, that's strung out across a pretty long distance, usually could be up to a hundred kilometers. Um, and then these vertical lines, which hang down from that float line are attached at regular spaced intervals uh, with baited hooks on them. So as you can imagine, that might attract some animals looking for an easy meal. And a, a line that measures 100 kilometers can have up to about 3,000 baited hooks on them. So that's a lot of lines, a lot of hooks, a lot of bait. And these long lines are typically used near the surface to catch open water fish like tuna, which is actually what they're going for. You can see the, the tuna right here. Um, or near the seafloor to catch more bottom dwelling fish. A major concern of long line fishing is that it's very efficient and it's not selective. So yes, they're hunting for tuna, but they catch a lot more species than just tuna. Um, and when we catch species that are not a target species, they're considered bycatch, which is essentially what a lot of these animals are like dolphins, sea turtles, um, rays, our sharks, even shorebirds. Um, and bycatch often consists of species that happen to be really vulnerable, sometimes even endangered, um, because they're simply attracted to the bait and they get caught on the line because they swallow the hook or they become tangled up in the line, um, which we see a lot with sea turtles. Um, and that really causes them to suffer significantly because our dolphins and our sea turtles, even our, our seals here at the end, those are air breathing animals. So if they're on this line or they're tangled in it, they can't necessarily get to the surface to breathe. Um, so that is a huge issue for them naturally. And sharks who are fish who need to keep swimming to pass that water over their gills, they can actually have a decreased oxygen. And so they can suffocate on those lines if they're not able to swim. Um, so, and these long lines can be kept out there for up to 24 hours and they take at least a day to haul in. And so those are very long lines. So it takes a while to come back to the boat. Um, so you can imagine that a lot of animals might suffer on this line within that time frame. Getting into overfishing. So the overfishing of sharks happens because of the huge demand, mainly for shark fins and kind of the lack of management um, to ensure that certain shark fisheries are sustainable, that they're not um, overfishing the population. And some species like the spiny dogfish, and there's a shark called the poor beagle, um, are targeted primarily for their meat. So they are being fished over and over again to get the meat from them. And as a consequence, these animals are often fished um, faster than they can reproduce. So we're taking the adults out of the environment before they've been able to repopulate, um, which is essentially what is declining the population numbers. Then we have shark finning, which is kind of, it's a growing trade, not here in America, but in other places. Um, it's often used to make expensive Asian soup called shark fin soup. Um, and this has really become a serious threat to most shark species as they're not necessarily targeting one shark over another. They're just trying to catch all sharks. 
Um, and the latest research shows that about 100 million sharks are killed annually for their fins, and that's it. Um, so this practice um, has fishermen catching the sharks, cutting off the fins while the shark is on the boat, and then they put the shark back in the water. As I've ne now said a few times about our shark species, they're fish. They need to swim to breathe. If they don't have fins, they can't swim. Therefore, they can't breathe. So they ultimately sink to the bottom while they're suffocating. Um, an extremely excruciating death for them. And as I mentioned, this affects sharks across all species. It's not just focused on one. And this picture is a little gruesome, but it's really just to show you the amount of shark fins that are taken in one day from one haul within these Asian countries that are trying to cater to the people who are wanting shark fin soup. So now we're getting into what I think is the most important part of how you can help. So first you can report your sightings. If you see a shark, whether you're in a boat or you're on land, please report it to the New York State DEC, uh, Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, they have a shark spotter page on their website and you can submit observations of the sharks that you see and that actually really helps their biologists figure out the species of sharks that are in their waters. A shark biologist can pretty much tell species of sharks by their coloration, the shape of their fins, and um, the length and width of their bodies. And that just helps us, these reportings helps them to better understand shark behavior, shark ecology. And then as I always say, respect the locals. So when we are in the marine environment, we are in the shark's home. So we need to be mindful of that, especially during the summertime, warmer months, they're here feeding in our waters. It's just something to keep in mind and know that they're not trying to directly harm you in any way. They're just trying to live their lives and be a shark. Uh, and that's just something that we need to remember um, as we share the coastal environment with them. So with that, I wanna encourage y'all to keep our beaches clean by taking any trash with you. Um, when you visit the beach and any trash you might find while you're down there, please be sure to stay 150 feet away from a marine mammal or sea turtle. We'll throw sharks in there too, um, but our marine mammals and sea turtles are federally protected um, so that 100, 150 feet um, is a strict distance um, through our federal agencies. Please report any sightings of your sharks to DEC of your marine mammals and sea turtles to AMCs at sightings at amcs.org. And if you come across any sick, injured, or deceased marine mammals and sea turtles, please call the New York State Training Hotline. If you come across any deceased sharks, please report them to DEC. If you call us, we will give you the number to call if you can't find it. So with that, does anybody have any questions? So there is a question in the chat. It's, okay. Are there any laws forbidding shark finning in New York waters? So shark finning is illegal within the United States waters. So that encompasses New York as well. So we do not hunt sharks for their fins, thankfully. Okay, and another question is, with the recent increase in shark attacks in New York, are there any theories why those numbers have gone up? Yeah, there's definitely some theories out there, um, some that have some backing to them. Um, so as I've heard through the year and a half that I've been up here uh, working for AMCs is that, you know, decades ago, we never saw whales. We never saw dolphins, sharks, not really. Um, and now that our water quality has improved off of our Long Island coastline, which means cleaner waters, so we are attracting what is sharks' prey items. Um, so we're attracting a lot of those bunker, which means they are then attracting sharks, but also our whales and our seals. Um, so that's really speaking to the health of the overall ecosystem out there. If these apex predators like sharks, whales, seals, weren't here in our waters, 
that leaves marine scientists to be concerned because that tells us something is wrong with the water quality. If they don't want to be here, we need to go look at it. Also, with climate change, global warming, we're having increased water temperatures, which makes it more comfortable for them to be in our waters. Um, and I think also maybe times years ago when social media wasn't as prevalent um, in all of our lives, perhaps people got, you know, bit here and there, but it wasn't as um, easily spread to others like it is now. Um, with social media. So I think there's a lot of factors playing into um, us, one, having more sharks here, and two, hearing more about instances with sharks interacting with humans. Okay, there's another one that says, why do we need sharks in our waters, and what purpose do they serve? Good question. So as I mentioned, sharks, apex predators. So our apex predators really help keep the ecological balance uh, within our marine environment. Um, so they are super important to that food web. So if they weren't feeding on these smaller prey items, then those prey items would overpopulate. And then that would affect the rest of the food web as well. Um, also some sh sharks uh, that I mentioned, those like bottom feeders, they're considered scavengers. So them eating those organisms that are already dead, kind of cleaning up that um, matter that's left behind when animals pass away, the shark scavenging on that actually leads to us having cleaner oceans, um, healthier oceans. So um, they really serve a huge purpose to the marine ecosystem as a whole, which is definitely why we would like to keep them around and well populated. Any other questions? Yes, we got another one. So it's okay. as my son Brayson is very interested in sharks lately. If this continues, I love to start prepping and helping foster his love for them. For the future, what different branches and careers are there related to sharks? I heard you mention shark biologist, so I wrote that one down. Yeah. <laughs> what are the like career options for getting into the field of, of learning about sharks? That is a great question. Um, so I can really only speak to what I know about the shark field. So there is a lot of different research opportunities for sharks or fish species in general. Um, and they can be really found along any coastline. So you don't have to stick to certain areas to work on these species. Um, I guess if you're can, interested in a specific species, maybe you would wanna go to that general geographic area. Um, but getting into just biology and general um, studying ichthyology, which is the study of fish, um, so most people don't realize that sharks are really just really big fish with bigger teeth. Um, so definitely kind of getting into that. And there's a lot of different volunteer activities if you're on Long Island um, to get involved with probably as he gets older um, and can learn a little bit more about the shark anatomy in and of itself. Um, as I always think, learning the anatomy is the best way to learn more about an animal and how they're going to live their life. Um, so yeah, I think becoming just a, a general biologist and focusing your research or your interests on um, ichthyology, which is the study of fish. Any other questions? And kind of speaking to that, shark research can really take you all over the world. I have friends who studied sharks in Florida and then traveled to um, South Africa uh, to go do research over there. They were specifically looking at white sharks. Um, and they do have a great population over there um, in South Africa. Uh, so it could definitely take you really cool places if you're interested in traveling. Okay, 
Okay, we got a few more questions coming in. Okay, so one, it sounds like global warming is impacting migration patterns. Is global warming impacting other aspects of shark life? I think it's impacting their migration patterns and it's also offering them to go areas that maybe they didn't before. Um, so it's offering them the opportunity to discover different, um, possibly different mating breeding grounds, different foraging or feeding grounds. So it's really giving them the opportunity to expand their geographical range, which is how we could potentially start seeing species here that we haven't seen before. And I'd be interested to hear if our shark biologists and researchers um, who work across Long Island and within the New England region um, in the coming years, discover any species that we haven't seen here before, simply because our waters have become warmer and now it's a suitable habitat for them. Any other questions? Not another question, but Carolina said, great presentation, thanks, and definitely going to look into some volunteer opportunities, which is just awesome to hear. <laughs> yes, awesome. All right, well, I want to thank y'all so much for joining me this evening. If y'all have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, Carrie can put my email in the chat. It's education at amcs.org. Um, if you have any questions specifically related to AMCs, to sharks, to marine conservation in general, um, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Before and, you leave, Lens, there is actually yeah. one more question that came in. Okay. Just, so is there a sliding scale of top safe Long Island beaches or is there a chance of sharks visiting each part of the coastline? Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, that is hard for me to answer. So the beaches that we have had shark encounters at so far this summer have been along the South shore, kind of in a similar area with the exception of Cupsog. There was a, a sighting, um, no interaction as, as far as I know, um, but it was Ocean Beach, so Fire Island area, um, Smith Point. I think there was another sighting at Jones Beach. So all kind of within that same area, which, you know, funny enough, is also where our whales can be seen quite frequently. Um, so again, our apex predators going for that bunker that's in the area. Um, as someone who lives with uh, along the North shore of Long Island, I haven't really come across any during my beach days along the sound. Um, but I think it's, it's hard to say because as we've talked about, these are marine animals, they're migratory. They're going to be moving throughout the water and really going for wherever their prey is. That is their, you know, what's always at the forefront of their mind is where can I get my next meal of fish? Um, so it's hard for me to tell you exactly, you know, what beaches you should go to, what beaches you shouldn't go to. My biggest suggestion is just to be aware of your surroundings, be um, attentive when you're within the water and um, never panic. When you see a shark, um, that's something you shouldn't do. Um, you can slowly move away from them, move into shore. Um, if you ever do find yourself needing to defend yourself um, from a shark, all of their, their main sensory area is their nose, which I understand is also near their mouth, but hitting them um, or kind of pushing against them at their nose kind of stuns them a little bit, kind of like when you get hit in the nose, it, it hurts. Um, so similar for them. So um, that is a good way to, um, if you would like to put space between you and the shark, um, slowly move yourself out of the water. Um, and if you need to defend yourself using that mechanism. And that is personal advice. That is not Atlantic Marine Conservation Society giving you advice. <laughs> Any other questions? Nope, just a lot of thanks and great presentation. Awesome. Uh, well, I hope y'all learned something. I hope you continue to enjoy your summer on Long Island. Don't be afraid of the sharks. Um, we're gonna share the marine <laughs> coastline with them. 
Um, so again, thank you all so much. Please email me if you have any questions. And have a great rest of your evening. Yes, Carolina, if you're still here, same thing. I've um, been diving with multiple shark species and I've never encountered anything as well. So I think it definitely comes with, with education and helping people to understand the uh, species specifically. Hey, Lindsay, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Yes, thank you, Catherine. Um, thank you for hosting us, and I hope to continue to work together, and I will send you an email after we log off of here. All right, thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, you too. Thanks, everyone.